Successful results we are getting are despite the increased size, if we would, for example, uh, uh, think about how to change institutional structures in a new setup in a way that would that would that would uh, not force people to do what they are doing uh, today. And um, there are many more examples. I have some of them noted here. Uh, you know, I have learned in physics that consensus formation is not an emerging natural thing or social thing in some discipline, but that they are using ethno methods of consensus formation uh, that allows them to integrate their field step by step at every meeting they have, they do that. And I can show you the methods. I can demonstrate the methods uh, as similar things happen in other disciplines. Now, I'm not arguing for a forced consensus. Please don't get me wrong. But I think that it would be possible to uh, take some of these or think about some of these methods of integrating a field and create a situation where there are at least contours of integration that, that would allow the field to ask questions based on what it knows, what it already knows today in a very dispersed state uh, and in a state where, uh, 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 where, where uh, the field uh, cannot uh, uh, function, I think, uh, in, in, with the same power and energy it could function given what it knows and what it does. Okay, I think I should leave it here. So I'm all in favor for more rather than less institutionalization. Thank you. Each of us could have followed the other in any order and introduced the other with the same Pythonian phrase that Harry used, and now for something completely different. Mm -hmm. But I hope what you've seen here is three different perspectives, three different people, three different modes of presentation, three people who've sustained over more than a 30-year period a passion for inquiry, not only into science and technology, but into, reflexively into our own way of studying science. I wanted to share with you a, just a brief note here in reference to something Karen said about what 1976 meant to us. This is the Constitution. She maybe doesn't remember this. Uh, this is the Constitution for uh, the workshop in the ethnography of scientific practice. Uh, this was a group formed in the conviction that we could offer more to prospective clients by combining our expertise than by working independently. Let me just, uh, I just want to read you the names of the original West membership. Daryl Chubin, Karen Fonosatino, Sal Rostivo, Sharon Trawick, and Steve Wilgar. This, this happened in some parlor, in some hotel room. Um, didn't last very long, but it was, a, it was an indication of something going on at that time where we were meeting pretty regularly. Uh, discussing ethnographic research and really in a very com comrade comradely way. And I've, I've taken the liberty of asking uh, somebody who was not at the first meeting, uh, but was at the second meeting, Trevor Pinch, to say a few words about what he's heard and also what he's experienced. And then that'll be followed by uh, somebody who wasn't at the first or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth, uh, etc. cetera, Alondra Nelson. To get a sort of newer perspective on what we've been about and where things stand from that perspective. So let me introduce now Trevor Pinch. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Can you hear me okay? Um, as Sal says, I'm, uh, I wasn't at the first Cornell meeting, and I represent the next generation. I kind of studied at the feet of these people. Um, and um, also, I'm not, it's not clear to me, this is meant to be a fireside discussion, and I'm not certain what the discussant of the fireside discussion does. And I didn't have access to any of the papers, so I thought, I, I, my, I think the main issue that I want to raise is this, that I'm struck by listening to the presentations, which is that something interesting happens with our society. It starts off as a society built around sociology of science. And it's quite clear 
that the I disciplinary identity of people like Harry Collins is as a sociologist, sociology of scientific knowledge in particular. It starts off for Karen as sociology of science, it becomes something more interdisciplinary later on. And for Sal, it's something different again, coming from this Marxist perspective originally, science for the people movement. And I think the thing is this, in reflecting on our society, that there are many more other perspectives in our society than these ones. But the society starts off, there's no doubt about it, back in 1976, and that was my own experience, as being about the sociology of science. So in, my, in thinking about this issue, I've been trying to think, why doesn't the sociology of science or the sociology of scientific knowledge actually institutionalize? And why do we become this much more broader thing? And, and so some reflections about that, really. Um, so what was I doing? I guess it's time to confess. What was I doing in 1976? Well, I was just beginning my adventures in sporadic unemployment. <laughs> I guess I was becoming a sociologist of science in what was to become Thatcherite Britain. I just finished my master's degree at Manchester University with a, a, a figure from the early, early field, Richard Whitley, many of you have forgotten about. And I was moving to Bath University to work on the topic of parapsychology with Harry Collins. Um, I remember Richard Whitley taking me aside before I went to work with Harry. He said to me, Harry's sitting on a pile of data down there in Bath, but he needs theory badly. <laughs> and when I arrived in Bath, Harry told me, forget that theory you learnt in Manchester. I'm going to teach you how to do real empirical research. <laughs> I tend to think Harry was right on that one. Um, there are also, I mean, there's already uh, lessons I think we can learn from what I've said already. I don't think so. Sociology of science in the UK in 1976 was not all in one camp. There were many different camps. This is a point Harry made. There was Bath, there was York, there was Edinburgh, there was Kiel, and Manchester, not to mention there was also Paris and Bielefeld. And this is just the British European scene, not to mention what was happening in America. See, the story in America is incredibly complicated. It wasn't just a bunch of Mercedes. It was very complicated. And as I said, the, the other point I'd like to say is that soci sociology of science was indeed the field back then, not science studies. Just think about those journals that came out. It used to be science studies. It became social studies of science. The, the yearbook that Richard Whitley and, and various people, Peter Weingart, Everett Mendelssohn and so on, Helga Novotny were involved in, was always called the Sociology of Science Yearbook. In Britain, we presented this work at something called the British Sociology, British Sociological Association, Sociology of Science Study Group where occasionally philosophers would show up. We'd have these meetings at the LSE, when philosophers would show up there. But the main field was sociology of science. And here's the clincher for this. In those days, even Bruno Latour was a sociologist of science. <laughs> well, sort of. And here's a bit of data on this. And I, I remember going, you always remember important <coughs> presentations in your life. My first presentation in America was in 1977 at a little conference that Bruno Latour had organized at the Salk Institute. And I was very nervous. First ever presentation in America, and I was talking about parapsychology. At dinner the night before, I remember this dinner very well. Karen was there. Harry Collins was there. Joe Gusfield, a very well-known sociologist with whom I stayed. Randall Collins was there. And Aaron Sickerell was there. And this was Bruno's reference group, and they were all sociologists. Bruno was working with Steve Woolgar, a British sociologist who'd been trained by another British sociologist, Michael Mulcahy. So what happens to the field of sociology of science between 1976 and, say, 1990? That's when I left Britain. Um, and the answer is that the field of sociology of science fails to institutionalize in the UK. Now here's an amazing fact. I didn't get to ever teach sociology of science, although I was a lecturer, which is equivalent of assistant professor in, in a British department for seven years at York, a well-known sociology department, before I came to America, until I came to Cornell. You could not teach the sociology of science as an undergraduate course in England. Michael Mulcahy did not teach the sociology of science. You had always had to find ways of disguising the sociology of science as something else, like rationality and relativism was a typical course we'd teach or just qualitative methods. 
And I think that's really interesting in thinking about what happens to the sociology of science. You can't teach this. There's no undergraduates. There's hardly any PhD students in Britain. Then we get sociologists of science such as Pickering, myself, Steve, Steve Shapin, coming to the US. And then when you move to the US, when we moved to the US, I think we had hopes that maybe at last the sociology of science will be institutionalized given all the resources that the Americans have. But no, American sociologists are not interested in the sociology of science. And we're in this, what I think is a very different field, which is science studies. And it's got different names, science, technology, and medicine. But the character of, of this field seems to be they are different objects of inquiry. It's like in the early days, Mulcahy used to talk about astronomy as a field that's going to areas of ignorance, as though new topics are coming up all the while. And you move into, and I've done this as well in my own work, we find technology, I found music recently as a topic, and we're drawing on more and more approaches. Feminist scholarship becomes important, anthropology becomes important, semiotics becomes important. So it's almost like there's a different field that's institutionalizing, and that is science and technology studies, as opposed to the sociology of science. So in framing questions of, uh, such as Sal presented, about, which often are uh, answered in terms of how has the sociology of science progressed, I think it's, we have to think, well, the sociology of science has become something else. Maybe the sociology of scientific knowledge, in Harry's sense, has continued. But it much, has much, much less influence than it had in the early days, and that excitement certainly seems to have gone away. I remember Harry, he won't like me for this, coming to Cornell, giving a talk, telling all our grad students, well, we're in a normal science space now. All the exciting discoveries have been made. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> remember that, Harry? <laughs> so, let, let me just end up with one little comment. Well, I, I think we should bring our other discussion and, and, and the rest of you into this far side. I think, you know, as we think about these sort of events, reflecting back on 1976 and all that, and this is where we bring in Malcolm Ashmore, we do need to be reflexive about it. Rather than acting like scientists and endorsing some simple origin myth, like the four lab studies in California myth, we should do justice to the real tapestry from which science and technology studies has been woven. We need to trace, I think, all the threads that, that have been woven into today's work. Threads some of which have become very threadbare and have vanished, as well as the threads that are still strong. If we don't do this, I think there's a real danger of something much worse happening, which is that the tapestry as a whole will start to unravel. Thank you. I just want to apologize for leaving the room. I, I was uh, in, in part of my former life a weightlifting and powerlifting judge. And you get evaluated on a whole list of criteria. One of the criteria, one criterion is endurance in the chair. I always failed on that. Alondra Nelson. Thanks, Al. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, okay. Um, so, Sal charged me in the spring with speaking for the younger generation, so I began with an apology to the junior faculty, postdocs, and graduate students here, because I know I can't possibly speak for you and all of your experiences in the 10 minutes or so I've been given. Um, what I'll do instead is talk a little bit about my trajectory, my experiences, and um, make a few comments about uh, what we've heard so far this evening. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I attended my first meeting in, in 2000. I was working on my dissertation. I had this kind of what everyone around me thought was a quite a wacky project. I was working on um, black health activism in the 1960s, and I wasn't so much interested in the social movements aspect, although I am interested in that, as I was interested in the kind of politics of knowledge around race and the body and black bodies in the 60s and the 70s. And um, so I had various people on my committee that could help me with aspects of this, including the late great Doc Nelkin, who died before I finished, and the late present Troy Duster. Um, and, um, and so I came to this meeting in 2000 where um, a small group of people that included uh, Wendy Boshpies and Michelle Murphy and um, Steve Epstein and Adele Clark put together two sets of streams that basically put my two worlds together. The two sides of my brain that have been thinking about this project came together in these series of streams on health social movements on the one hand and race and post-colonial studies and science and technology studies on the other hand. 
And, you know, channeling Martin Luther King, I thought I'd come to the promised land. I haven't missed it. I hadn't missed a meeting since. It was the place where my work made sense. And um, Professor Conor mentioned, you know, hospitality and generosity. And I think I was also struck at that meeting about how wonderfully inclusive and generous the scholars were. And Adele actually is serving as my mentor for a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship that I have this year. And um, one of the things I said at a meeting that we had a few weeks ago was that she did the kindest thing. She just simply said hi to me. And I think that 4S remains a meeting where people will just sort of like do radical things, disobedient professional things like say hello, right? Um, and I think it makes a difference for junior faculty. And I think that the, you know, the, the fact that the, that the society remains fairly small is, is significant. So, um, so um, I guess I just wanted to say a little bit about my work and then I'll say a little bit about tonight. Um, so I was looking for frames of reference and role models for the work that I sought to do and continue to do on racial formation processes in science, technology, and medicine. And following Professor Pench's observations, my work is certainly science and technology studies rather than sociology of science, although I'm jointly appointed in a sociology department. Um, and I wanted to marry my interest in race, racial epistemology, social theory, science, biomedicine, um, um, together. Um, and I guess what I wouldn't have anticipated when I came to the 4S is what happened after um, the decoding of the human genome and the fact that race and human difference are now so central to um, studying genetics and, and human biology right now. So it was quite a prescient meeting in that way and it really has informed, I think, how so many of us think about um, human difference and race and ethnicity in this moment. Um, so, um, and it would come, come to play a key role in, the, in um, how I thought about my work. So just a few comments about um, what we heard so far. Um, about uh, Sal's presentation, I guess I just wanted to say, um, you know, that I agree with him about um, social constructions remaining a central dogma of the sociological imagination. And I think this is borne out of particularly in my own work, um, which looks at race as both a subject and an object of science and technology. Um, it's in some ways, you know, a hard case. Um, so I just wanted to echo what he said there. I guess I was most engaged with Professor Collins's presentation. Um, I guess I had a few things to say. I was struck by um, the, the comments in 1994 about the incredible negativity of science and technology studies because my impression, particularly as someone who studies genetics, is that there is um, an incredible kind of euphoria and positivity um, at this moment as opposed to a negativity and that there's this kind of an embrace and there's a danger of a kind of uncritical celebration as we study and I'm, again I'm talking about my particular kind of area of study um, uh, and, and my purview from studying the social implications of genetics. Um, so I think that we, you know, we should be cautious both of, you know, just the, the sort of un, um, uncritical negativity about, about science as a, a practice, as an epistemology, but also about a, being unduly sort of celebratory and positive. Um, let's see, I wanted to also say a few words about um, how science has changed. I think any, uh, one of the things that didn't come up in any of the three um, presentations was how science has radically changed since 1976. And, and has changed the way that we need to look at it. And my work is really about the public understanding of science. My new work is on um, consumers of genetic genealogy tracing tests. And I do some work, you know, interviews and some field work in laboratories, but I'm mostly interested in sort of outcomes and social implications. And I think that um, what wasn't addressed tonight was the fact that there's a new generation of people who are really looking at kind of the sociology of science of everyday life, right? The way that science has just become a part of the lives of everyday people in a way that it wasn't in 1976, in a way I think that we couldn't even have anticipated, and that that changes in some ways, um, some quite radical, some not, the diagrams that Professor Collins put up about the, the P or the not. Um, so, um, and I, I guess, you know, I guess I'm being just a little bit provocative, but I wonder if, if the changes don't make us, and this is again riffing off Professor Collins, all scientists of a sort, right? Not experts necessarily, but there's a way that science kind of circulates in the day-to-day -day life that's, that's different in some ways. And then I wanted to end by um, saying a little bit about perf the, the idea of, of, uh, of 1976 and all that being a generational discipline. I hadn't thought about that, and it's really striking. Um, Professor Knorr framing it in just that way and people at the beginning of their career. So I leave it to the comments of people in the audience to talk about their answers to that. I've said a few words about what I think about that. Um, but I, I think that, um, that there's still lots of interesting work to be done and that uh, I'm excited to be a new and young scholar in this field. And 
And I'm also really um, just proud and happy to be in a site where um, you know, someone who, a young scholar, a graduate student who had a lot of ideas but no direction, found a way to find her way. And I also see Sandra Harding back there, who's a personal hero of mine, so I just want to say hi to her. Who's, who's work also <laughs> seriously great Thank you very much. Actually, quite a bit of time, thanks to my great organizational abilities, uh, for questions from the audience. Or comments, or many lectures, which happens. Yes? Um, this, is for, uh, this is for everybody, including, I guess, Trevor. Um, I consider myself to be a sociologist, but I'm a young scholar myself, so uh, I'm confused by all this. Uh, this kind of shaping of, of what sociology is, because I, I guess what I'm doing is not sociology, according to a lot of you. Can you tell us what you're doing? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm studying social networks, but, but studying the people who make social networks rather than the actual networks themselves. I do a bit of ethnography, I do a bit of ethnomethodology, I do a bit of philosophy, I suppose. But we, we, had this, we had some people, I can't remember who it was, some people saying, I'm, I'm not doing sociology, but I'm, maybe, maybe it was the last time, I'm not doing sociology, but I'm, I'm affiliated with Sociology department. What makes, what is, I don't understand what the difference is. <laughs> um, well, it sounds like you're doing sociology. <laughs> <laughs> what, well, I mean, my point was more about, about think, we have to think about the institutional context, think about a field developing. I was just trying to look at it like that, in terms of training graduate students, students being able to teach it. It's a kind of paradox that this field that seems so exciting at that moment doesn't really get institutionalized. It doesn't mean to say that people can't do sociology. That was more my point. And the field that does seem to have a chance of being institutionalized at the moment is this wider field of science and technology studies. It doesn't mean that you can have individual, individual people can do whatever they want happily. <laughs> I just have one comment to that. There are many fields emerging now that are really combinations of things. For example, psycho, psycho, neuro, psycho, immunolog. No, neuro, what is the sequence? <laughs> well, psycho, neuro, endocrinology. Yes, three fields and possibly more being added into the thing. Uh, in the area of nanotechnology, you have all kinds of combinations right now. And uh, it, it shouldn't mean I think it would be very problematic if indeed people in the area of science studies or whatever we call it don't know any sociology anymore because there's a lot of tools in sociology, both methodological and theoretical, that are useful and helpful. Also, we can get silly attacks by people not knowing what sociology is doing and denouncing it. And, and that is redundant, I think. We don't need to put a lot of effort in that sort of thing. But at the same time, I think that it is indeed a, 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 it is a discipline that has gone beyond sociology and integrated other things and should be open to additional things. Uh, but um, as I said, it should become a discipline in its own way. So carry on with your sociology. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, as several people mentioned in, in, in different ways that you know, as, as the field matures, we are maybe becoming a bit like the scientists we're studying. So does that mean that STS as a field is socially constructed? And uh, if so, in, in what ways and how? And how? Well, we had, we, had the, um, we had a whole period of five to ten years <laughs> where we discussed the question to what degree uh, uh, the constructedness you know, applies to us like it applies to the sciences. Of course it does apply to us too. But it doesn't, uh, I don't know what the implications of your questions are, what you mean to ask beyond that. Yes, it applies to us. We use the same tricks and we use the same strategies, even though that doesn't necessarily mean the same exact techniques or methods? One of, the, one of the issues that's raised there is the classic issue raised by the sociology of knowledge, as originally created by people like Monheim and Shalit. 
both Durkheim and David Bloor in Knowledge and Social Imagery, answer critics who argue that there's, a, there's, a, there's this problem of self-refutation. That problem has been answered by both Durkheim and Bloor. And if people would just take the time to read this stuff carefully, we, we wouldn't have to keep doing this over and over and over again. I want to say but by one, one, one thing. One person who wasn't at the 1976 meeting was David Bloor. But what was going on in media, they were all, they were all plenary meetings. What was going on in many of the sessions, while people were speaking, David's book, David's book was circulating. There, was one, there were one or two copies, maybe just one, being circulated. And everybody was sort of getting sort of engaged in that book, even though Bloor, Bloor wasn't actually there. <coughs> The last, the last uh, question sort of took me by surprise at the, uh, at the beginning, but I think that's because I think it's framed the wrong way. I actually, I don't know, I think it's not as though some things are socially constructed and some things aren't. I, I actually think what we've learned to do in, in society is treat anything we like as socially constructed. We've become incredibly good at it. One of the problems is we've become, it's, it, we've become so good at it that we've forgotten how to not do it from time to time. We've got to kind of learn how to not do it on occasions. But it's, you know, it's a terrific skill, I think. You, and you discover how skillful it, how, what a terrific skill it is when you come across people every now and again who haven't got the sociological imagination and don't know how to think about things sociologically. I mean, I was just transcribing an interview on the plane here where my respondent just didn't understand the questions I was asking him because he couldn't see that I wasn't asking him about whether he was being honest in his science, but how what came to be counted as doing the right thing in this particular passage of science came to be so counted. And this question was completely beyond his understanding. Yeah. And so every now and again you come across this thing where you suddenly realise, you know, we've actually learned a lot of very a lot of skills, but I don't think I don't no longer think of social constructivism as a sort of something you find out about the world that this bit's socially constructed and that bit isn't, but rather that it's a methodology you apply. I also wanted to address the uh, institutional issue, and I do this as, a, I suppose, a, a fellow traveler uh, for about 20 years. I went to the, for my first meeting in, I think, 84. Um, and and the point I want to make is that uh, we have to look at the institutionalization of whatever we call this activity in relation to the institutions with, within which they find a home, and that's by and large universities. But again, I speak primarily from an American experience, but some, some knowledge of Britain and, and Scandinavia and also Asia. Um, I think of STS as one of a whole series of failed interdisciplinary projects that have failed fundamentally because American universities aren't really capable of dealing with institution with interdisciplinary projects. They only understand disciplines. So when Karen says we need to disciplinize, or some version of that, I'm both saying yes, we have to, because that's the only option. And I also think that that's terrible, because whatever it is that's good about this is that it's an anti-discipline. Uh, and that's precisely what makes it open uh, and available. So I, you know, I don't know. I mean, the reason I describe myself as a fellow traveler is having tried at one of the SUNY campuses in the 80s to explore an STS institutionalization. That didn't work. Now I'm in a, in a professional field in informatics where we're doing something which is in, in many ways parallel to a piece of this field, but doing that on, on a professional terrain, which is also in its own way not a discipline. It's not an intellectual activity. So the, the pleasure of STS for me has always been to come and have the kind of lots of different perspectives and yet feel at home, but I also think in an important sense that's purchased at the price of not disciplinizing. And I, you know, I, I feel like it's sort of in that fundamental contradiction and has stayed there for 20 years and, and likely to continue. Well, um, I mean, I, I, I don't agree with the consequence. I think the time is ripe now for the possibility of institutionalizing a different sort of discipline because there is the example of the natural sciences requiring that, doing that, getting money for it, and flourishing with it. It should be possible. Of course, I agree 
you can probably not uh, go to the university president and say we, we want to make this a discipline uh, and then it would follow that it would be a department and has to comply with all the rules already in existence. You would have to somehow escape some of these rules, but not necessarily because we want to be more interdisciplinary. I think that they would need to recognize at some point. But because we should be more reflexive about what we have learned and apply it to ourselves, we should apply the knowledge we have or we take, we constantly take from other sciences and uh, ask ourselves, how would we set up a thing hmm, that, that doesn't make the mistakes the traditional disciplines make because they cannot be reflexive, because they are constrained, they are forced into this, even though many of the, uh, the professors and so on, you know, distance themselves. When I go to the anthropologists and tell them, why are you sending, you know, individual people to the field in India to do a case study and then come back and be, you know, with, with very powerless results because it cannot be done that way. Why aren't you allowing them to do it together or some such, so that at least there will be some sort of uh, enablement, you know. They, they, they say, oh, yeah, 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 I, I agree with you, but we cannot do it. And so you, it, I think maybe that's why I suggested a, a different institutional form, like that of a center, if it could be done somewhere and others could follow would be the way to do it and to include in that center the advisory function because that will be a very important function and we don't necessarily want to leave it to consulting corporations and firms and we don't want to leave it to knowledge management and they are doing it and they're going to do it like they do it in some sociology areas already. We want to retain or bring back to us, many of you do that anyway, so we want to make that an official component of a newly institutionalized field that works into itself the things it has learn, learned about science. And I don't see why that should be impossible. Of course, you need the financing and convince someone somewhere. Let me try to get up the right order here. Uh, so, uh, I don't want to be negative, uh, but just to back up the last speaker, just thinking of the experience in Australia, where during the 80s we would have had about probably five fairly significant uh, STS units, which actually grew out of history and philosophy of science units. Uh, and I think that was because sociology has always been, in general, very resistant to STS in Australia. I'm pretty careful what I say with people behind me. But what's interesting is that uh, the trade-off of changing to HPS to STS units was extraordinarily exciting, extraordinarily fruitful, and if you look at the situation today, a complete failure institutionally because there's practically nothing left. Uh, and there's lots of individuals who've done extraordinarily well, but the field has dwindled away. Now, some of that's the traditional micro-political problems, but also it is, I think, uh, an indicator of if you don't anchor yourself in some kind of disciplines, you're very vulnerable to political change uh, with governments and funding. So the trade-offs, I think, are quite huge and not to be... I think it's easy, perhaps in the US, where there's more resources, to talk about institutionalising, or parts of the US. I should say, I know your system's very complicated as well. But if you haven't got resources, it would be nice to say you're a sociologist. If you've got resources, it's nice to perhaps be an STS person. Can I add another national perspective? I think, Carol, I don't think we, we can do what you want us to do. Think about on the level of a field, about strategies, whether it's wise to make a discipline or not. I think we should learn from all the different national perspectives here. And I'm from the Netherlands. And, well, we have a long fight all the time. But I think I agree with the previous speaker that it's a very richness being not being a discipline and not being, you know, framed into a specific structure because, at least from my experience now working in the field for more than 20 years, it is, we, since two, uh, three years now in Twente, we have a department where other disciplines joined us. So we have science studies, we have health sciences, we have policy studies, all joined together. And this is interdisciplinary. We have very many different methods, but we are seen as a big unit now. And this is, I think, because we were not arguing 
that we want to stick to our own disciplinary methods, <coughs> like say, I'm a sociologist, or I'm a philosopher. No, it's about the level about how you can convince the dean or whatever at the university that you're studying topics that are very relevant for policymakers or for society at large. So it's still also coming back to the roots of the STS movement in the beginning. So that's a bit of the issues back then. Yeah, I don't think uh, I meant anything else than that. I didn't mean we should become sociology or some such of, of science. I meant we should, we have a wonderfully designed topic. We have a bounded unit, science or knowledge areas. We have a unit that's still studyable, that is very important to societies today. It is called the driver of the postmodern or post-industrial or post-capitalist or whatever, the future, the global world. It's called the driver of that everywhere. And we are uh, enabled to study, we have a history of studying it for, for more than 30 years. Why should we not be capable of making the point, okay, we are in the position of giving you the knowledge that you all, uh, you know, long for, that you need, we are in the position of doing that, but we need a larger unit, we need some resources, we need the capacity to teach ourselves and not to be attendants to a history. That, that is precisely the problem, you know, as long as you remain a committee, like we are in Chicago, or, or some program, or some such completely outside, uh, nobody takes you serious. And, and that needs to change, either by becoming a department and negotiating a different, you know, some different rules that, that, that apply being an interdisciplinary department, and, but insisting as a reflexive discipline that has studied the sciences that some of the mechanisms should change. And who, if not we, can make that point? And why don't we make it? Why don't we go to the deans and argue for it? Why is that not happening? Why are we staying, you know, as satellites of other uh, entrenched disciplines that don't change? That is very frustrating. Okay, I mean, I'm, uh, I wonder if, I, I would actually like to know, I'd, I'd actually like somebody to work out why these, dis, why these disciplines didn't, didn't actually take off in various countries, because I know why it didn't take off in Britain. I mean, Trevor said it didn't take off in Britain, and it hasn't got that, well, it's got a slight, had a slight chance in Scotland. The reason it didn't take off in Britain is because British departments make money by teaching students, and the stuff is too hard for students, because they have to combine the two cultures. Okay? It's sort of taking off now with, with, with some of the softer sciences coming in, but the, you know, when, certainly when it used to be, there used to be a lot of physics studies, the physicists didn't want to do the sociology, and the sociologists certainly couldn't do the phys physics. And that's, it was, it was a very contingent thing like that. I mean, I remember from my early days, I thought, we will build a discipline here. And I was watching at the same time criminology, which was expanding enormously. I think, well, we'll expand like criminology. But we never had a chance for those reasons. And maybe there's contingent things in other countries. Let me make a comment about my own experience of RPI. As our students have become increasingly interdisciplinary and open, in the sense some of you have mentioned, one of the things that's open now for discussion and negotiation is, is science social? I found that, I just find that impossible to deal with. Okay, so here we have somebody back here, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Excuse me, I, I took my glasses off, so oh. if, I don't, if, I, if I know you and I don't call you by name, sorry. Judy, actually. Um, it's just that, I mean, I think some of us are feeling sort of, I mean, this is slightly tangential, but, but feeling slightly kind of alienated from the discussion in terms of what the object of our joint kind of project is. And I'm quite struck by how all the speakers have much more come from science studies and much more been emphasising science studies. and. You know, for me, the big move has been towards the socio-technical, and I know all the speakers would totally kind of agree with that. But, you know, when I kind of emphasise some of the things we've kind of learnt and talk about, it's materiality, it's about knowledge and objects together, um, it's about those kind of concrete things. And so, and once you start doing that, then the whole object of the discussion is less kind of science studies but STS, which is going back to something that kind of Trevor said. And... You know, I'm now moving into mobile phones for 
kind of various reasons. And people say to me, oh gosh, why don't you go to the new media conferences, the International Internet Conference, you know, there's a million other conferences on informatics, you know, um, oh, many, many things. And I don't um, want to just go to those things, I want to bring kind of those interests here. So, you know, partly the difficulty is what the kind of, how, how we differently really conceptualise the kind of um, object, subject, and, and, you know, partly, Trevor, I was just curious when you said, well, it's, if it's going to be institutionalised, then it's STS. I mean, you know, I personally am sort of ha rather happy about that, but were you making the, a different sort of point? No, I agree, I agree with what you said, and that would include the sort of research you've just mentioned. I mean, that would, under, the, uh, under what we call S and TS, the ampersand is important for us as well, differentiated from science, technology, and society. What we call at Cornell S and TS, that sort of research would fit in. what they call cluster hires. And this is a perfect for our field, these cluster hires. We, we make, this is what happened at Wisconsin, you make groups of hires in related disciplines, and we are really nicely positioned for a lot of these clusters. So that there is this you know, chance of getting new resources, new positions, I think, at this moment. We've been here quite a while. Do people, are really, people who really want to ask something or say something, or are we ready to break? Let's break. Thank you all very much. Excuse me. One announcement. One welcome to Vancouver. I am Wanda Bauschke, the one responsible. Well, well. Hello and welcome to Vancouver. I'm Wenda Bauschby, the one who's responsible for putting this massive conference together. And I'm so delighted to see all of you here on a Wednesday night. And shortly at 8.30, the junior single mingling will be right here in this room. And we do need to um, bring in the bar. There will be a cash bar here. If you happen to be hungry, we're really right in the center of everything. And if you just walk out the hotel, turn right, Go not even a block. I'm sure you'll find something to grab, eat, come back. So we encourage all of you to come back, mingle. They've got a lot of activities set up, and it's going to be a new event, and hopefully one that will continue it for us. Thank you so much for being here, and well, welcome. Food at the event. Unfortunately, it's just a cash bar, so if you need some food, there is plenty out on the road. Thank you.